Hello, and welcome to our webinar, HarperCollins Children's Books Winter 2022 Book Preview. I'm Susan McGuire, Senior Editor, Collection Management and Library Outreach here at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We'll do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Last but definitely not least, Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the caption at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Today, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from some special guests, but first, let's meet the HarperCollins Children's School and Library Marketing team. Patty Rosati, Director of School and Library Marketing, Mimi Rankin, Marketing Manager, and Katie Dutton, Senior Marketing Associate. Thank you all for being here today, and without further ado, I'll pass it on to Patty. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're, uh, you're joining us today. Um, we are thrilled to have you with us. Um, and we're gonna tell you about a bunch of our uh, Winter 22 titles, just, to, just the tip of the iceberg of uh, some of the titles that we want you to know about. And we have three amazing creators and a special video from another amazing creator to show you today. Um, next slide, please. Um, you may have heard that earlier this year, HarperCollins, uh, we announced our acquisition of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Books, and we've since been working on structuring the merge. And I'm really happy to tell you that on the children's side, HMH joins us as the Clarion Group, and it will comprise the Clarion and the Versify imprints. Clarion will remain the home of all of the HMH and Clarion frontlist and backlist children's books that you know and love, like The Giver and A Long Walk to Water and the Little uh, Blue Truck series. We at Harper have long been admirers of the Clarion and Versify list, and I really, uh, my team and I cannot wait to work with these creators, and we will be sure that you are as well informed about Clarion and Versify books as you always have been. So thanks for that, and then next slide, please. We're gonna start off with picture books. And um, if you go to the next slide, please, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker. You and your kids know uh, Pete Oswald, the illustrator of The Bad Seed, the Good Egg, The Cool Bean, and next month's The Smart Cookie. All best-selling picture books that lots of you tell me are the most popular, can't go wrong picks for read-alouds in your libraries and classrooms. Pete has illustrated many other books and his author-illustrator debut, Hike, was recently shortlisted for the CILIP Kate Greenaway Medal. In addition to making picture books that kids just love, Pete Oswald has worked as a char character designer, concept artist and production designer on many successful animated franchises that you and your kids also know and love, like Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Hotel Transylvania, the Angry Birds film franchise, and the Oscar-nominated Paranorman. Pete's newest picture book, Being a Dog, A Tale of Mindfulness, written by author Maria Gianferrari, introduces young readers to mindfulness in a super engaging way. And I'd like to give a side note shout out to the back matter that includes prompts for a mindfulness walk that engages all the senses, as well as a guided breathing exercise. We could not be happier to have Pete with us live this morning from his home in Los Angeles. Please help me welcome Mr. Pete Oswald. Hi everyone. My name is Pete Oswald. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I'm super excited to talk about my new book, Being a Dog. Here's the cover. Uh, Being a Dog, A Tale of Mindfulness is written by Maria Jean Ferrari, illustrated by myself. Uh, I'm a dog lover, so naturally I was attracted to this project. Um, I've been around dogs my entire life. I think, you know, us humans can learn so much from them. 
Um, dogs are always living in the present moment. I'm a father of three, three, three active uh, boys. And so, you know, being present is something I focus on daily. Um, when I read Maria's manuscript, I immediately knew I wanted to, to illustrate the story. Um, I love the simplicity and thoughtfulness of the text, has such a great message. Um, at the time I was contacted to work on this project, I was experimenting with a new cutout art technique that combines all my favorite processes from drawing, cutting, and painting. Um, it occurred to me that this new art technique is very mindful and it complements Marie's text nicely. I wanted the illustrations to have a handmade organic feel. Um, I have a short video um, that shows my process more in depth. So I wanna share the video and then we'll read the book together. Share my screen. Okay, here's the video. So now that we know a little bit about the process, I'd love to, to read the book um, and, and share this with, with everyone. So being a dog, a tale of mindfulness. Can you be like a dog? Being like a dog is being right now. Not before or after, just now. Stretch while you rise, wag your body, greet the day and everyone you love. Munch your food, lap your drink. Can you sniff like a dog? Breathe deep, sniff, sniff, sniffing everything. Let's play like a dog. Invite your friends, then romp, race, and chase, tag, and tug. Play every day, rain or shine. Like a dog, feel what you're feeling, bark if you're worried, Growl if you're angry, yowl if you're sad, sing if you're happy. And if you're really happy, wag your whole body again and again. Be curious, feel the emotion, then let it go and be. Let the wind ruffle your fur, nap in the sun or the shade. Wade and watch in the water, tunnel and shovel in the sand, hide and leap from the leaves, whirl and roll and swirl in the snow. Take a taste, but not if it's yellow. Let's sleep like a dog. Notice the night, feel the fatigue, circle before you sleep, drop and dream. Let's be like a dog right now. And as Patty mentioned, there's three pages at the end that talk about mindful, uh, being mindful and, and things that we, we can notice and, and listen to. Um, I know we're a little cut, you know, short for time today, so I'm just going to show you these pages. Um, there's some mindful, mindful breathing exercises, but uh, I love this book and I'm so excited to share uh, with everyone today. So thank you for tuning in.
Thank you so much, Pete. That was incredible. Um, I adore that book. And I think that it, it's honestly really helped me be present and do my breathing exercises. <laughs> So, it does. We, we all need it, right? You know, it's so I, calming. I love it, yeah. I love it so much. Um, Thank you, Katie. Yeah. So uh, my name is Katie Dutton. I'm here today to present uh, some more of our upcoming picture books. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'll start right away. Uh, picking us off is the debut picture book from Stacey Abrams, the iconic voting rights advocate and the number one New York Times bestselling author. Stacey's Extraordinary Words is an inspiring tale of determination based on, on Stacey's own childhood about a little girl who discovers the power of words after competing in a spelling bee. Next slide. This book has so much to love about it. It's about believing in yourself, learning how and when to speak up, managing emotions, navigating tough, tough situations, and of course, how beautiful and powerful words can be, especially the word perseverance, which may just be the most powerful word of all. This has some fantastic back matter that includes a personal author's note and a glossary of the words Stacy uses in the story. Next, say, next slide. Many of you are familiar with the highly acclaimed Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. I am delighted to share with you its equally brilliant and beautiful follow-up, Eyes That Speak to the Stars. Next slide. Author Joanna Ho and illustrator Jung Ho team up again to deliver a stunning story in which a young Asian boy learns to love his eyes. Inspired by the men in his family, he recognizes his own power and strength from within. In a really, really phenomenal author note, which is available in full on Edelweiss, Joanna writes, like its predecessor, Eyes That Speak to the Stars is ultimately a story about love. It is the story of the love shared between generations, the love we must develop for ourselves, and the love that we use to create, to create change in the world. She goes on to say, confronting racism, both interpersonal and structural, requires eyes responsibilities. It requires finding and creating light in spite of the darkness. It requires us to be visionary. I hope Eyes That Speak to the Stars can open critical dialogue about matters of race, history, invisibility, power, and responsibility. I hope it pushes us to see and build towards a future of shared humanity and liberation. I hope it helps us become visionary. We'll publish this in January. Next slide. Next up, we have Nigel and the Moon from debut author Antoine Eady and illustrator Gracie Zhang. This is a story about a young black boy with big dreams who learns to move past fear of judgment and share those dreams. Next slide. When Nigel looks up at the moon, his future is bright. He imagines himself as an astronaut, a dancer, a superhero, but Nigel can't find the courage to share his dreams. It's really easy for him to whisper them to the moon, but not so much to his classmates, especially when he feels out of place. This is another one with a really powerful author's note in Edelweiss. I encourage you to check it out. For now, I will read just the first few lines. Dear reader, to dream is an honor. To dream big is a privilege. To silence the dreamer is an injustice. Nigel and the Moon was inspired by the dreams of the unsung and the unlived, the halted dreams of those we've lost. Trayvon Martin, Nigel Shelby, Tamir Rice, Gigi Bryant, the many lives lost at Sandy Hook Elementary School and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High. All dreams, all dreamers, all halted. But in Nigel's world, a young black schoolboy discovers his dreams and finds his voice. Next slide. Who Are Your People, written by Bakari Sellers and illustrated by Reggie Brown, is an inspiring picture book and a tribute to the family and community that helped make us who we are. Next slide. From bestselling author Bakari Sellers, Sellers comes a timeless celebration of the ancestors and roots that help shape young children into whoever they want to be. This helpful text is an homage to community, that it takes a village to raise a child, and that all of us stand on the shoulders of those who came before. In the vein of I Am Enough and Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, this spare lyrical text will resonate with young readers and adults alike. Next slide. When the School Shut Down is an awe-inspiring autobiographical picture book about a young African-American girl named Yolanda who lived during the shutdown of public schools in Farmville, Virginia, following the landmark civil rights case, Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka. Next slide. Most people think that the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954 meant that schools were integrated with deliberate speed. But for many, it was a very different story when public schools were shut down in retaliation for the new law being passed. This book is a true account of an unconstitutional effort by white lawmakers of the small Virginia town to circumvent racial justice by denying an entire generation of children in education. Next slide. 
Fall Down Seven Times Stand Up Eight is the only picture book biography about unsung hero Patsy Takamoto Mink, the first Asian American woman elected to Congress. Next slide. From a young age, Patsy Takamoto Mink learned that striving for goals came with challenges, but she also learned never to give up. As the Japanese proverb says, fall down seven times, stand up eight. That spirit helped Patsy through school. She wanted to become a doctor, but at the time, medical schools didn't admit women, so she carved her own path. She went to law school, ran for a seat in the United States Congress, and helped create Title IX, the law that requires federally funded schools to treat boys and girls equally. This is just a fantastic legacy. Um, it's brought to life beautifully. Next slide. With lyrical text by Emma Uxell and stunning illustrations by Mariam Qureshi, One Wish, Fatima al Fari, and the world's oldest university is the true life portrait of Fatima al Fari, an extraordinary Muslim woman who founded the world's oldest university. Next slide. Fatima never gave up on her dream of creating a school for all where everybody could study, and she worked hard to make her one wish come true. For over a thousand years, Fatima's One Wish, her school, has served students and scholars from around the globe, and it continues to do so today. Next slide. This is the inspiring and beautifully illustrated picture book biography of American artist Alma Thomas, the first Black woman to have a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum and to have their work chosen for the White House collection. Next slide. In a blaze with color, readers meet an incredible woman who broke down barriers throughout her whole life and is now known as one of the most preeminent painters of the 20th century. Jean Walker Harvey is not only the author of the critically acclaimed picture book about another inspiring female artist, Maya Lin, artist architect of light and lines, she's also a longtime docent at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which adds such a lovely layer of true appreciation to this text. And if this art style seems a little familiar to you, it's probably because Love is Wise is a phenomenal illustrator on the rise and most recently illustrated another breathtaking book on our Harper list from Evie's The Boy, The People Remember. Next slide. Me and Miss Two is the debut picture book from two-time National Book Award finalist, Laura Ruby, and it is a heartwarming, playful, and deeply felt story about blended families. Next slide. For as long as Molly can remember, it's always been just her and dad. But that was before dad married Miss Two. Now everything has changed. Spoiler alert, they're about to discover that maybe change isn't always scary. Maybe change can be the best thing of all. Based in part on Laura's own experiences of becoming a stepmother, Me and Miss Two is a story of care, love, and understanding, and of how separate mismatched pieces can come together to make a family. It's a gorgeously written story paired with equally beautiful illustrations by Jung Ho, the illustrator of Eyes That Kiss in the Corners and Eyes That Speak to the Stars. Uh, the details in this artwork are just spectacular. I'm a little obsessed with Ms. Tu's fashion sense and her interior design skills, um, particularly the part where she fills every room in the family's house with books when she moves in. Uh, this one goes on sale in March. Next slide. What makes you big? What makes you small? From acclaimed author illustrator Nina Cruz comes a picture book that introduces young children to the concepts of size and comparisons. Next slide. It is time to play outside and it's easy for a young boy to feel small in a world that's made up of big, big things. But when he takes a closer look, he discovers that he is big too. His dog is smaller than he is, his cat is definitely smaller than his dog, and the teeny tiny ant crawling across the grass, even smaller. This book is fantastic to spark family and classroom conversations about the concept of size, about growing up, about feeling seen, and about observing the world around you and finding your place in it. Next slide. And rounding out our picture book section for today is another picture book debut from an award-winning middle grade away author, the incredibly talented Tang Ha Lai. Next slide. 100 Years of Happiness beautifully showcases the love between grandparents and grandchildren, the challenges of memory loss, and the joy that sweet reminders of a faraway home can bring. An's grandmother, Ba, sometimes get trapped in her cloudy memories. An and her grandfather, Ong, come up with a plan to bring her back to a happy moment. They grow gook fruits so they can make soy gook, Ba's favorite dish from her wedding in Vietnam many, many years ago. This plan, I'm not gonna tell you how it all turns out, but it's so lovely and heartwarming. They, um, it's so wonderful. Anyway, the sweet and emotional picture book will resonate with readers who love a big, big mooncake for little star, ladder to the moon, and thank you, Omu. Um, and I think that's it for me from today. All of these are available on Edelweiss. If you go to content and then links, you'll be able to download the full interior PDF right away. So over to Patty. Thank you, Kate.
that was good. We've got some good stuff coming in winter and you did a great job. So thank you. Um, I'm just jumping in quickly to give a plug to another virtual event that we're hosting next Wednesday, again with our friends at Booklist. Um, it's called Picture This Home and Community. Um, for about an hour, we're going to visit with four illustrators in their home studios. Uh, we've got Oge Mora, Dan Santat, Leanne Cho, and Kevin Henkes on board. And they'll all talk about their art processes and how creativity has given them a sense of home throughout their careers. And particularly in this last year when the concept of home has really taken on a new meaning for, for lots of us. Um, I expect that we'll see lots of behind the scenes goodies like sketches and book dummies. And I think that the, uh, the theme of community and home is going to lead to a really great conversation. So please join us if you can, um, or you can of course sign up and then you can watch it, you know, uh, after the fact, if that time doesn't work for you, as you can with all of these virtual events. So um, that's my plug for um, our next virtual event. I'm really excited about it. Um, next slide, please. Here we're going to turn our attention to middle grade. So next slide, please. Uh, and please allow me to introduce you to a terrific author and an all around amazing human being that I've had the pleasure of working with for many, many years. Leslie Connor is the author of award winning books for children, including National Book Award finalist and Schneider Family Book Award winner, The Truth is Told by Mason Buttle, Waiting for Normal, which was another Schneider Family Book Award winner, a Home for Goddesses and Dogs, All Rise for the Honorable Perry T. Cook, and Crunch. Her new book, Anybody Here Seen Frenchie, will hit shelves in February. It tells the story of two kids who are both neurodiverse and what happens when one of them disappears from school one day. It's another big hearted, beautiful, funny novel that I've loved since I read it last year. Here to tell us a little more about it is Ms. Leslie Connor. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Patty. That was so sweet. Uh, greetings, everyone. Boy, have I missed you. One of the hardest things about the pandemic for me has been not being able to see my book people and librarians. I have missed you so much. And even though I can't see you now, I think a webinar is you know, the next, next best thing to being there these days. Uh, thank you to Harper and to Bookless Webinars for hosting this day. It's so great to come together and just enjoy a slew of great books for 2022. Those of you who know me know that I am kind of firmly in the middle grade wheelhouse and um, that in my books, I will usually write to you from the perspective of, you know, the underdog, the oddball, the kid who is maybe, um, well, neurodiverse or experiencing a disability. And always, always, I try to let you know within the first few pages for these, especially for these young readers, that the character that they're, they're meeting is going to be resilient um, and it's okay. Um, you, can, you can rest easy and take that risk and follow them into the story. I always hope that I can make kids laugh um, and if I make them cry, I think that that's actually okay too. I like the stories where I hear that the teachers have been crying. <laughs> okay. So I am going to um, go to the, some slides now and, and y'all can get rid of me. And what I'm going to ask is that in technology, crossing your fingers really, really counts. So if everybody just does me that favor, we'll get over there where we belong. And it looks like it worked. So I'm sharing with you this beautiful cover um, for anybody here seen Frenchie. I think that um, Ramona did such a beautiful job. I also zoomed in on some details so they can really appreciate the little strokes she makes. Um, she also introduces you to the main character here, which is kind of fun. You are looking at the back of Miss Aurora Pauline Petraquin. She is 11 years old. She's the kind of kid who is in constant motion. She's loud and enthusiastic and impulsive to the point that she has trouble keeping friends, with one exception. Nathan French Livernoy, always called Frenchie, he's her bestie. He's never spoken a word to her. He's autistic and non-vocal, but when he silently chose her to be his person three years ago at the beginning of third grade, she chose him right back. And I thought I would read to you a little bit in Frenchie's voice. This is an alternating um, book for uh, several reasons, which I'll talk to you about. But this chapter is called, She Was Aurora. 
Frenchy Livernoy stared at the field beyond the mailboxes. Birds were there, low in tall grass. The girl came up from behind, running, spinning, jumping. She landed beside him. She spoke at him. Wood rat. Quiet is good for seeing birds. So Frenchy kept watch while the girl hissed right into the hole of his ear. She told him, S -s -s soon, bus. The girl's voice was one, single, clear. It gave Frenchy the feeling of birds without seeing birds, lightness in his fingers. It moved inside him on the path through his arms, down his ribs, it made his shoulders inch up, a tug from somewhere inside. Pretty soon, he knew she was Aurora. She looked where he looked, at the field where the birds flew up, Aurora called, woo, woo, wee. Well, did you know those were there all this time, Frenchy? She flapped her arms. Arms are like wings. They are not wings. Hands are like wings, but they are not wings. Frenchy watched the birds put dark flicker shapes on the pale sky. They drew loops, then grew small as dots. When the birds were gone, Frenchy flapped his hands. He meant to make bird song. He thought he had, but there was a rumble down road from where he stood. It juddered the bottoms of his feet. He felt it at his middle. Aurora called her one clear voice. Frenchy, it's coming, bus. She was Aurora and Frenchy was going with her. So in the early chapters of this book, you really see the intensity of this friendship. Um, their families are also very tightly bonded and Aurora and Frenchie share a love for the natural world. They are always hiking, always blueberry picking together. And Aurora is a sort of budding geologist. She's a rock hound, whereas Frenchie is all about the birds. Aurora looks out for Frenchie at school. She knows that he's very tied to routine and pattern and she knows how to help him when he's overwhelmed. And she knows the challenges too of loving an autistic person. Um, she's also psychologically responsible for Frenchie in a lot of ways, even though he's the one who can always find the way home <laughs> when they're out hiking. Um, let's see, what else did I want to tell you about this? Um, I guess that I guess I'll go into a little bit about um, you know what happens from the author's perspective when we sit down to write a book. You know, there's always kind of a collection of things in the hopper when I go to start a story. Authors do that. I think we let things fall at us and we hold on to experiences and observations. And when we don't have everything we need, we go get it. And that's called the research. I do like to tell um, you know young readers about that part. Um, but I also came to this book with just a couple of thoughts in my mind. And one was that with a story that centered around the vastness of autism, which I desperately wanted to treat carefully and get right, um, it really, but really almost to the vastness of all human behaviors, um, I wondered particularly what happens in a friendship when one person begins to kind of outgrow what's been there for years. Uh, maybe is able to better employ strategies that will win them social acceptance, you know, a little bit more than the other. Um, and that, that I think, you know, is, is part of what happens between these two kids. Um, and I wanted to just, I mean, it's no, it's no secret that Frenchie um, does go missing as Aurora begins to kind of expand her social circle. And when he does, uh, Aurora narrates this to you in one of her chapters. This is a very small section. It's called A Worst Possible. This is the feeling of a worst possible. I mess up a lot. I say I'm sorry about 10 times a day and mom and pop tell me that's okay and to move on from those things. But a worst possible is bigger than that. It sticks harder. And I think the only cure is a time machine. That's what I want now. I want to go back to, the more, to this morning. I want to walk through the doors of the school and not have Frenchie behind me. I would put him beside me. I'd get him to his classroom and I'd see him go in. I close down hard on my eyes. The worst possible wells up in me. Frenchie, I whisper into the air, where did you go? So you can see that, you know, it, it's she's actually really stressed out about that, about, about, you know, him not being, it's very uncharacteristic for him to have left, but that's what he's done. That's exactly what he's done. All right, I'm going to move on through some slides here and talk to you a little bit more about some of the things that sort of fell into the bucket for this story. 
Um, this is a piebald deer that, oh my heart, visited um, my yard and um, the woods near my home for about a period of 23 months or so. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do about him in terms of being an author, but, you know, he kept returning and my research on what a piebald deer was began almost immediately. Uh, and um, my, my, uh, I remember that my agent saw pictures of this on, on Instagram and said, um, could it be that this creature will reach its way into a story? And I thought, oh, you bet. I want to show you as he grew a little bit older, um, you can see, I mean, that's how we knew he was a male. First, the little nubs showed up and then it's, I know these pictures are a little hard to see, but he does actually have a little bit of a, of a small, you know, rack on his head there. And I wanted to read you a short passage about how this part fell into the book. This is Aurora narrating. On the path ahead, I heard a swish, then a clacking sound like rock against rock. A flash of white and brown streaked across the trail. I halted, so did Frenchie. What, I whispered. I thought someone's goat was running loose. The animal stopped in the high grass under the twiggy trees. It turned back and looked right at us. I caught my breath, not a goat, a deer? Yeah, because fly swatter ears. But this deer was not like any I'd ever seen. It was spotted from head to hoofs with a lot of white on its coat. The tip of his nose looks extra round like a black rubber ball. And its snout was whiter and broader than I'd ever seen on a white tail. And with a dark marking along the center, a pair of brown diamond shaped patches gave the deer a perfect mask pretty as a stuffed toy with dark eyes shining out and the white eyebrows arching upward. Wow, I whispered so low. Now Frenchy, I hoped he would get what I was about to say. You don't bother with birds at a time like this. So they became quite uh, interested in this deer and kind of like it happened to me, um, they found that they were able to see it often and even to follow it a little. Um, one thing I have kind of, I don't know if it's across the board, but my research turned up is that piebalds are not as shy as other deer. There are also some other things about piebalds that um, bring a lot of heart into this story. So I'm gonna move on. So one of the images I saw as I was starting this book was something to do with a bowl in the earth. It was something that I wrote down late at night just before sleeping. And when I um, visited a, um, an abandoned granite quarry in Maine, um, I found it, you know, sort of dangerous and beautiful and eerie, and I knew that that was going to become a part of the setting. Setting became really important to me. Um, as you can see, like I say, beautiful, but also a little bit eerie. It was kind of amazing the way that plants were taking hold there. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I wanted to know too, you know, what Aurora and Frenchie were seeing and, and what was underfoot. So I made sure that I visited Maine during the time of year um, that uh, we would see, you know, I wanted to know about all the feathers and the nuts and the trees that would be there, whatever, you know, whatever all would be, um, what they would see, whoops, I skipped two. Um, and there was a lot of help along the way, which was kind of nice. And some of the help was really kind of funny. And I think sort of helped me, helped inform me about the voice I wanted to use here. Um, I checked out, you know, what the sun was doing that time of year. I wanted to get that right. And I also studied maps and um, took a lot of hikes myself and thought a lot about, you know, oh, who can help in this search because the community comes together in that sort of collective effervescence, which is a, a phrase I absolutely love. But it was so interesting to find out what the search strategies were. And I think that maybe kids will really enjoy this aspect of the book, kind of the map reading and, and uh, modern ways that things happen. And I'm gonna just show you this um, again, this is, um, um, this is where, um, in case you missed it, uh, uh, um, Ramona really did a beautiful job of creating this artwork for this book and also cleaning up that map I used. And uh, that is part of the book, which just absolutely thrills me. Let me just tell you, I think it's gorgeous. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Leslie. Uh, it was such a joy to see all those stunning pictures as we head into the fall season. Um, this is truly a wonderful book. So I can't recommend to librarians listening enough to definitely add it to your orders. 
Um, so I'll get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks so much again to Leslie. Um, my name is Mimi Rankin. I'm a marketing manager here at HarperCollins Children's Books. As a reminder, these books are available for request on both Edelweiss and NetGalley. So first up, from the award-winning author of a, the A Boy Called Bat uh, series comes a new middle grade series starring an unforgettable girl named Harriet. Now, there are a few things you should know about Harriet. She just finished third grade. She has an adorable cat named Matzo Ball. She doesn't always tell the truth. And she's completely happy to be spending her summer with her grandmother in her Airbnb on a California island. Okay, maybe that last one wasn't the truth. Follow Harriet on her adventure to solve Marble Island's mysteries in this fun early middle grade novel, similar to the ages of Alana's Bat series. And this is perfect for fans of Ramona and Clementine. Next. Set against the backdrop of Caribbean culture and folklore on an invented Caribbean island, Lisa Stringfellow's uh, mesmerizing middle grade debut tells of a grieving 12-year-old Keila who unwittingly forms a connection to a fearsome mermaid who has the power to bring her mother back to life in a story of impossible wishes, redemption, and magic based in deep friendship and love. This is certain to enchant readers who loved Case and Calendar's Hurricane Child or Christian McKay Heidecker's uh, Scary Stories for Young Foxes. Next. Award-winning author uh, Sarah Zarr brings her gorgeous writing and immense heart to her middle grade debut, a lovely, sophisticated, and authentic examination of divorce, poverty, and blended families starring an unforgettable girl named Lou. Sarah does not venture out of the YA space lightly. She has brought all her style, sophistication, and skill for which she is known in YA to a song called Home, marrying it with a pitch perfect middle grade voice and a perspective that is perfectly calibrated to the middle grade emotional experience. Next. In this heartfelt middle grade novel from debut author Nicole D. Collier, fifth grader Jillian must learn to speak and break free of her shell to enter her school's academic competition and keep her promise to her grandmother. With diverse family dynamics, strong female friendships, and some adorable baby ch uh, chicks hatching in Jillian's classroom, this warm and relatable debut novel encourages readers to find the confidence to break free from the crowd and be who you truly are. Next. Every day in Fawn Creek, Louisiana is exactly the same until Orchid Mason arrives. From Aaron and Trotta Kelly, the winner of the Newbery Medal for Hello Universe and a Newbery Honor for We Dream of Space, this contemporary school story set in small town Louisiana is about friendship, family, deception, and being true to yourself and your dreams. And I know we are all excited for new Aaron and Trotta Kelly. Next. The standalone companion to a National Book Award finalist and beloved poet Naomi Shihab Nye's The Turtle of Oman, uh, this is The Turtle of Michigan, and it is a deft and accessible novel that follows a young boy named RF as he travels from Muscat, Oman to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and adjusts to a new life and a new school in the United States. A wonderful pick for young middle grade readers and fans of Other Words for Home and Billy Miller Makes a Wish. Next. All right, what do a sheep, a rooster, and a duck have in common with Benjamin Franklin? Well, they're all ingenious inventors, of course, and they will have to work together to save the world. Hilarious, action-packed, and highly illustrated, this standalone tour de force from acclaimed author-illustrator Matt Phelan is perfect for reluctant readers and for fans of Skunk and Badger and Flora and Ulysses. Next. Ernesto Cisneros, Pura Bel Pre award-winning author of Efren Divided, is back with a hilarious and heartfelt novel about two best friends who must rely on each other in unexpected ways. Through thick and thin, Isaac and Marco have each other's back. Uh, the boys face down some difficult situations and feelings as they begin sixth grade, whether within their families, their friendships, or themselves, but their story is ultimately one of hope and love that will tug at your heartstrings and leave the reader smiling. This is such a wonderful friendship story. Uh, this is a great next pick for readers who love Ghost by Jason Reynolds or The First Rule of Punk by Celia C. Perez. Next. Oh, Eliana, I love this book. Uh, an inspirational and unforgettable nonfiction novel and verse about Zana Arshak. Arshanskaya, excuse me, uh, a young Ukrainian Jewish girl using the alias Anna, whose phenomenal piano playing skills saved her life and the life of her sister Frina during the Holocaust, from award-winning author Susan Hood with Zana's son Greg Dawson. This includes extensive, and I mean truly wonderfully extensive, back matter with original letters and photographs, additional information, and materials for further reading. This is such a great addition to any World War II collection and truly one of my favorite books on this list. Next. 
This is perfect for fans of Jason Reynolds and Kelly Yang. Uh, readers will love this heartfelt and genuine story about building community, finding family, and the power of Black girl magic. Uh, Unfatable so is a story following Bella Unfatable Fades, a wiser than her years graffiti artist, hoping to lay low as she's living on her own, who ends up in a position where she needs to protect her neighborhood. But that means putting herself out there, something she has never done before. The story touches on tough topics, including homelessness, with care for the middle grade audience, with representation for kids who don't often see themselves in kid lit. Author Marcus Broadus is a special ed teacher and he was inspired to write the story because he felt the kids didn't have um, many characters they could relate to in children's fiction. And for more on this and his perspective, uh, definitely check out his author letter, which is in our Edelweiss collection. Next. All right, Wingbearer, a young girl must stop a threat to her magical world in this epic graphic novel from New York Times bestselling and Eisner winning author Marjorie Liu of monstrous fame and remarkable debut illustrator Tenny Isaacanian. Uh, at the heart of this epic fantasy is Zuli, a brave brown skinned girl who was raised by bird spirits at the edge of the world and thus has never seen her own reflection, let alone another person who looks like her. As Zuli sets out into this fantasy landscape and makes friends with other winged creatures, she also starts to see hints of other people like her in the statues and paintings depicting the world's history. In this way, the book very subtly speaks to the power of diverse representation and the importance of being able to see oneself as a hero in an adventure. Next. All right, and lastly, I just want to touch on some uh, new books from your favorites. So first, Amari and the Great Game. Uh, this is the highly anticipated sequel to the New York Times bestselling Amari and the Knight Brothers. And this is part of the Black Girl Magic filled Supernatural Investigations trilogy. I'm so excited for the sequel. And then from uh, this, uh, I'll switch over to <laughs> Operation Do-Over from New York Times uh, bestselling author Gordon Corman comes a hilarious new friendship story with classic back to the future like vibes. And then the School for Whatnots is about uh, a school where privileged children learn alongside robots who appear to be real children. It is bananas and amazing. In classic Haddock's fashion, things aren't quite what they seem and twists and turns in the story expose truth about privilege, humanity, and friendship. So that is it for middle grade, but we have plenty more titles in the Edelweiss collection that will be sent around after this webinar. And again, these are also available for request on both Edelweiss and NetGalley. Now back to Patty. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Mimi. And thank you, Leslie, for uh, talking to us and, uh, and, and telling us more about um, the fantastic uh, Frenchie. So one thing that we uh, folks who work in publishing love is um, new talent. Is, is when we get a manuscript to read from someone that, who has never written before and, um, and we get to, and then, and then we get the book and then we get to work on it. Well, that's how we felt when we saw the manuscript for Laura, our next speaker's um, new book um, called Messy Roots. Um, as soon as we read it, we thought, boy, do we want to meet this author and boy, do we want to introduce her to all of our, our librarian and teacher friends and family. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Laura before I turn the uh, mic over to her. After spending her early years in Wuhan, China, riding water buffaloes and devouring stinky tofu, Laura immigrated with her family to Texas, where her hometown was as foreign as Mars, at least until 2020, when COVID-19 made Wuhan a household name. That March, Laura was inspired to create a webcomic titled The Wuhan I Know, which went viral and landed her a spot on NPR. Since then, Laura's written and illustrated her debut YA graphic novel, Messy Roots, a hilarious, and heartfelt coming of age story of a girl figuring out her identity as a queer Chinese American. Laura is working on a second book while living her best life, traveling all over the world in the past year. We could not be more excited about Messy Roots and the start of what will be an amazing book career for Ms. Laura Gao. Please help me welcome her. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be featured here among all these other amazing books. Um, for this presentation, I wanted to show y'all some exclusive behind the scenes content about how this book came to be. All right. So as a quick recap, um, that's me. I'm Laura Gao, and this is my book, Messy Roots. I know the common tactic to get over stage fright is to imagine your audience naked, but since I can't really see any of you, uh, I figured my first slide would just be me in a dinosaur onesie. So now nothing in this talk can be as embarrassing as that. <laughs> Which is saying a lot because I'm about to show you some 
baby photos. <laughs> so I was born in Wuhan, China. Um, this is me and my cousins right here. I spent my early childhood there on my grandparents' farm. I like to play this game to see if people can guess which one I am. Harper may or may not have prizes for people who guess correctly. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Three, two, one. There you go. I am the little cutie there on the right. Now, since my memoir is about my life, I'm going to show you a drawing from the book that corresponds to each picture I'm going to show you in the presentation. My cousins and I, we got into all kinds of trouble. We'd ride water buffalo and we'd steal fruit from the fields. And my popo, my poor popo here, um, she's my grandmother from my dad's side. Uh, she was this tough butcher knife wielding farmer who never finished second grade, but had a PhD in getting kids in line. Before long, my parents and I immigrated to the US and that's where we had my little brother, Jerry, the first official American of the family. We lived in a small town in Texas called Coppell. The town was predominantly conservative, Christian, and white. And so as you can imagine, uh, not a very fun place for me. <laughs> An Asian from a hometown most people couldn't even pronounce uh, and a closeted queer. Thankfully, I had art and books as an escape. Here are some of my art from elementary school to middle school to high school. Um, they're the ones my mom thought were good enough to pen on the fridge and save. So that's still the highest achievement I've gotten to date. <laughs> um, books were a huge part of my life. I was practically raised in the library as a child of two working class immigrants who often wouldn't come home until very late into the night. The school library and our local library became my second home. I'd read everything I could get my hands on, you know, like Magic Treehouse, Goosebumps, drawing books. But what I could never really seem to find in my small town were books written by and about people like me. That is until I came across a shiny book in our newly created comic section. So I'm gonna show you this excerpt talking about that exact experience. So this is me, you know, being the moody, broody teenager um, on my bed. I'm upset because I had to skip out on a mall date with my crush Hank and his friends uh, who are all white and uh, because I had to go to Chinese school. So the truth was I could have ditched Chinese school if I tried, but I was afraid I'd stick out among Hank and his friends. They were all so damn hot, like the high school musical actors with their gorgeous sleek locks. I tried everything from dyeing to straightening to shaving off my thick black hair. But the roots grew back even more tangled. My mom proudly said her jeans were to thank for my hair. Frankly, the only jeans I wanted were the ripped ones on Abercrombie models, but she said, that's what poor people wear. Here, I'm about to shave off my eyebrow. Yeah, yeah. What the fudge do you want, Jerry? Mom says we're going to the library. Here's my little brother holding a library tote that we probably got from a summer reading program. Mom took us to the library every weekend. It was our version of being kids in a candy shop. I always made a beeline for the new comic section, though section is generous. The single shelf only carried a few superhero comics and four Naruto volumes, all of which I binged in a month. But oh, -ho. American born Chinese, a Chinese kid. And my brother and I are bantering here. Really, Jerry? Captain Underpants? You're still reading picture books. They're graphic novels. And here I do kind of like a the office style cut to the camera where we look at the reader. My mom comes in. 
who are you looking at? And she throws this giant cardiovascular diseases for kids book on top of our pile. Cardiovascular diseases? Learn something useful. You'll thank me when you're a rich doctor. Blood and germs are gross. I like drawing. Can you buy a house by drawing? My art teacher says being happy is all that matters. That's so American. Well, it's the American dream, mom. I never asked to be the oldest kid in an immigrant family, just a generation removed from poverty. Popo told me stories of how people starved and had to abandon babies. It's my reimagination of what my ancestors looked like or thought of me. <laughs> young, young, you're our only hope. Avenge the family bank. Give us smart children. The only thing I was starving for was Hank's attention. Was I really cut out to be my ancestors' greatest hope? That's my mom. Uh, what happened to your eyebrow? I uh, ran into a wall, <laughs> a flat wall. Yeah, my ancestors were screwed. So yeah, that's an excerpt from Messy Roots. Um, all the comic books I read growing up were huge inspirations and especially American Born Chinese by Jean Lu and Yang. Um, I got the chance to visit that same library this year when I went home. And now that little shelf has actually transformed into multiple sections of both Eastern and Western comics, which is pretty sick. The first time I visited Wuhan again was a whole decade after immigrating when I was in eighth grade. Here's me with the same cousins all grown up. Um, I left that feeling, feel, I left that trip feeling more confused than ever actually, because I had thought going back to my hometown would mean I fit in once again, but I didn't feel like full Chinese. I, like I didn't feel like fully feel Chinese like my cousins either. The college is where I got to finally bridge those two sides of my identity. I became best friends with other Asian Americans and we learned from each other. It's also where I came out and met my first girlfriend. After college, I got a job in San Francisco where I knew I didn't have to hide my Asian-ness or my queerness anymore. I truly felt like the world there was my oyster. That is until, oh, oops. Yep, you guessed it. Everyone here knows what happened, so I won't bore you with all the details, but during that time, my folks were fighting two things, the disease and lockdown in Wuhan and racism in the rest of the world. I couldn't stand feeling helpless anymore, so I decided to channel my emotions into a comic, The Wuhan I Know. And to my surprise, it went viral on Twitter and got picked up by NPR. But the most rewarding thing was a note I got from an Asian mother. So I'll read this here to you. This is on my Instagram. Jess Marie says, I have two beautiful Chinese daughters and I'm so grateful for your work. Thank you. And I respond, thank you so much. Did you show this to your daughters too? And she responds, yes, your work has helped them to talk and express how they're feeling and to feel pride in their birth country. China will always have a special place in their hearts. Thank you so much for giving them a voice. After this, I knew that this could be more than just a simple webcomic because for someone to truly understand why there's hate in the world and how to love themselves despite it, you can't just combine the story to a pandemic because racism identity transcends any single event. It's a journey you go through every single day. And that journey is what I want to share with Messy Roots. And so Messy Roots came to life for all the other younger lores out there who feel, um, to feel empowered to live unapologetically and love themselves no matter how messy their roots are. Thank you so much. That was just perfect, Laura. Thank you so much. I love those pictures and I love the, uh, the dinosaur onesie, perhaps most of all. <laughs> Thanks. I would wear it if I had it today. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some of our team titles. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, this first one up, this is a clarion title with a, with a look at that jacket. It's a real pick me up, I think. 
um, A Secret Society, A Hunt for Lost Magic, and four siblings who are each hiding their own secrets. The Ivory Key is epic character-driven fantasy. It's a debut, and it's the first book in an Indian-inspired duology, perfect for fans of their Will Come a Darkness, The Gilded Wolves, and We Hunt the Flame. We will publish in January. So this past summer, like so many other adult and teen readers, I fell hard for Addie LaRue. I could not wait to get my hands on another book by Victoria Schwab, and I was delighted when the manuscript for Gallant uh, became available so I could fall back in with this master storyteller. Gallant is dark, a dark original story about life and death, and the young woman beckoned by both. We reached out to Victoria at her home in Scotland and asked her to say a few words to you about her new book. So he, I'll stop talking and turn it over uh, to Victoria, if you please play that video. Hi there, I'm Victoria Schwab, author of a bunch of books from The Savage Song to The Shades of Magic trilogy to The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, but I'm so excited to be telling you today about my upcoming YA novel, Gallant. It hit shelves March 1st, 2022. I like to say that this story is The Secret Garden meets Crimson Peak. It is a story of a 14-year-old girl named Olivia Pryor who has spent the vast majority of her life in an orphanage called Maryland School for Girls. She knows nothing of her family. The only thing she has is a journal that was left with her, written by her mother. It is fairly scary. It is very dark. But what I love is that even though this is a YA novel, I think it will appeal to a lot of adult readers and a lot of middle grade readers as well. Olivia Pryor is 14, an uncommon age for a YA protagonist. And her concerns are less about firsts than about finding family. In that way, there are a lot of really strong lower YA and upper middle grade themes to explore. I'm hoping that this is a story that serves a place in your library for those readers who, like me, might have felt like they slipped between the cracks, between middle grade and YA, between YA and adult teenagers who were still trying to come of age, who were looking for themselves well into their teens looking for their voice, looking for where they fit in the world. I just want to say thank you for everything that you do, for the role that you serve in our communities and in our industry. I want you to know how important you are. I'm sure you already do know, but it never hurts to hear it. And I so hope you enjoy what you discover when you come to Gallant. Oh, great. She's, she's awesome. Oh, and the finished book's going to be really stunning, too. Um, the jacket's great, as you saw. The end papers are going to be designed. They're going to be interior ink drawings of that journal that Victoria spoke about. So um, anyway, we're publishing a uh, gallant with a lot of fanfare in March. And here is another gem for fantasy fans. This one is by the best-selling author of the Shatter Me series, Tahara Mafi. Clashing Empires, Forbidden Romance, and a long-forgotten queen destined to save her people. This is the first in an epic romantic trilogy inspired by Persian mythology. Now we didn't have the jacket ready for this uh, slide presentation, but Tahara is going to be um, unveiling the cover this afternoon, I'm told, on her social channels. So check that out if you can. Next slide, please. And this is a debut, another terrific debut. This is Booksmart, Booksmart the movie, the great movie, meets Never Have I Ever in this Latinx road trip adventure about two sisters who couldn't be more different but become begrudging partners on their school's cross-country college trip as they unpack weighty family expectations and secrets and maybe even discover the true meaning of sisterhood. This is by debut author Angela Velez, who draws from her own experiences growing up Peruvian-American and a first-generation daughter to shape Lulu and Milagro's journey. We will publish in February. At Chandler, an elite boarding school, five teens are brought together in a circle, in the circle, a coveted writing group where life-changing friendships are born and secrets are revealed. Their professor tells them to write their truths, but is the truth enough to change the long-standing culture of abuse at Chandler? And can their friendship survive the fallout? This is from the Stonewall award-winning author of Like a Love Story. It's a revelatory novel about the enclosed world of privilege and science at an elite boarding school and the unlikely group of friends who dare to challenge the status quo through their writing. And this is actually based on Abdi's own um, experience at, at such a school. Next slide, please. I think I'm gonna hustle up a little bit because I think we have a couple of questions. So I'll go real quick. 
Um, this is All That's Left in the World, and this is another debut novel. Um, this is probably best described as What If It's Us Meets the Apocalypse, where two teen boys find unexpected romance after a deadly pathogen wipes out most of the world's population. It's a good one. Put that in your TBR. Um, next up is a teen graphic novel. It's fantasy set in the Middle, uh, Middle Eastern inspired world that follows 14 year old Asia, who trains to become a knight for a war torn empire while hiding her true background as the member of a subjugated rebel class. The author, Nadia Shamas, is a Palestinian American writer from Brooklyn. She's best known for creating Corpus, a comic anthology of bodily ailments, and for uh, Ms. Marvel, Stretch Thin. And the artist is a Jordanian American illustrator, creative director from Boston, known for her work for Marvel Comics and Star Wars. And then our last slide, just to tell you, we've got two new books coming from two great authors. Um, from the author of Happily Ever Afters, One True Loves is the highly anticipated companion novel. It's another irresistible YA romantic comedy. Um, this one, um, it's Black and Multiracial Love and a Dreamy European Cruise. And then Love Boat Reunion, last but not least, uh, this is the companion novel, novel to Abigail's best-selling debut, Love Boat Taipei. We're going to publish that one in January. I'm throwing picture this up there again because I think it's going to be an amazing event and I just wanted you to remember to sign up for it. And this is, uh, you can access all the titles that we talked to uh, talked about today and more, many, many more. This was really, truly just the tip of the iceberg of what's coming in winter. So check out Edelweiss, check out NetGalley. If you aren't already signed up, sign up, let us know that you're a teacher or a librarian, you'll get approved like that, well, within 24 hours, I'd say. Um, and you can check out our picture books and you can check out galleys for all of these books and more that we talked about today. Um, we're all over social, Harper Stacks is our name, so please follow us. Um, and then uh, Grace or someone from Booklist, are there a couple questions that we could ask? I think we've got like 10 minutes left. I think there was one for Pete that I saw early on. Um, would you be able to handle that or should I pop in and, and take care of that? Sure, we can handle that no problem. Great. Thanks, Grace. Let me just pull up Pete's question here. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, if I can just invite our wonderful um, author and illustrator panelists to please unmute or come on screen too. One moment, please. So um, Pete, let me find your question. If you'll bear with me for one minute. Great. I have it, Grace. Do you mind? Oh, great. I yes, yeah. jump on in, Patty. Okay, great. Um, so one thing, uh, Pete, I, I was hoping that you don't have a fan blowing in your office when you have those little cutouts all over. It's very <laughs> for you to come in and doing all of that amazing work. But that's not the question. The question <laughs> is, so uh, you are drawing and cutting them out physically. So are you drawing and cutting them out physically, taking a photo, and then painting digitally on that image? That is, yes, that is correct. So I, um, first I draw traditionally, I, I sketch it out and then I, on a, uh, I take another piece of paper and I trace and I cut that outline out, um, to create the silhouette. Then I compose the, the, the image on just a blank piece of white paper, take a photo with my iPhone, import those into Photoshop and cut those pieces out and then paint them digitally. Uh, and it gives me a lot of flexibility to color at different um, tones and and to really kind of tweak the 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 contrast and everything. Uh, it combines everything that I love, you know, traditional techniques versus uh, digital techniques. It's like this like merging of of these uh, of of everything. Great, thanks, Pete. Yeah. Um, I can't access the oh, the other questions in the Q&A. Grace, I don't know if you can. Yes, I got one actually. Um, so we have one for Laura. So there's a question for Laura that says, thank you for sharing your creativity and sharing your work. When you are not reading or writing, what are your other interests? It's a great question. Um, I love anything music related. So I love playing music. I play keyboard and ukulele. I love singing and making music covers um, that are also on my Instagram. And then I also love biking and playing basketball too. Great. 
And um, one more for Leslie, actually. Um, Leslie, uh, we have a question about what is coming up next for you. I don't know if you're able to share some of those secrets, but we'd love to hear anything you can share. Um, yeah, I well, I am beginning work on another middle grade novel. Um, and I think I'll sort of simplify down and say that it's going to be a complicated sister story. So I've been brewing that for a while, and I think it's finally ripe. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you. Well, I think those are all the questions we have time for. So Patty, I'll pass it over to you for any closing remarks. And then we'll hear from Susan to close out the webinar. Yeah, just, just a quick thank you um, to all of our uh, presenters today, for Mimi and Katie, and then of course to Pete and Laura and Leslie. We can't thank you enough for, for spending this hour with us. And um, to our librarian and teacher audience who are watching today live or will be watching the broadcast, the rebroadcast, you know, a, a lot of the authors today or the uh, creators today talked about how they were raised in the library. And I think that you hear that from a lot of other, um, you know, terrific uh, picture book and uh, novelists. So thank you. I mean, um, you, 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 I don't think always know um, who you touch and how you do it, but um, we appreciate you. We love you. We hope you're hanging in there. We can't wait to see you in person. We're thrilled that you are joining us virtually like this um, since we can't be together in person. So thanks a million. Thanks to our friends at Booklist. We love partnering with you. Um, and then I'll toss it back to you guys uh, for final housekeeping. Thanks a million. Thank you for that gratitude fest. I love it. Um, thank you so much, Patty, Mimi, Katie, Pete, Leslie, and Laura. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here, including, as mentioned earlier, another wonderful webinar with our friends from HarperCollins featuring four fantastic illustrators. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and log in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of the special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Patron-friendly, librarian-approved, and free with a Booklist subscription, Booklist Reader, Booklist's new digital-only magazine highlighting diverse readers' advisory recommendations for all ages, has arrived. To see and share the latest issue, which is currently freely available to all, visit booklistonline.com slash reader hyphen issues. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. One more huge thank you to our panelists and our sponsor, HarperCollins Children's Books. And this concludes today's webinar.